So we are back to the large class, unfortunately because of this rescheduling, which means as well, if you don't want to listen, just leave now, because then you allow the others to listen to what we need for the exams, what we have to recap. And basically, it is trying to do the impossible again, going within this two hours, or actually less than two hours, through what we did throughout the year. And I'm talking about throughout the year, not just throughout the semester. We started last time. where we started from this general framework and trying to come from there, narrow things down and come to what is now known as economics in terms of a very narrow framework that deals with production and markets, supply and demand due to exchange on the market. So, this is narrowing it down, and then we reintegrated things by saying production, looking at the cost of production, what constitutes the cost of production, and looking at what is going on on the market is limited because there are institutions, there are social choices, and there is behavior. But we always concentrated these issues, linking them back onto the question of production, production cost, and what is going on on the market. We re-embedded, we reintegrated things. And then we set a framework saying what actually is happening is about something like welfare, something like using resources in an optimal way, maximizing the resources. And this was very much linked, and is very much linked to what is called or known as Pareto Optimum. And as such, it is not a welfare function, but it is setting a framework for economics that allows us to get some idea of an aim of the entire process of economics and of economic activity. Then we moved on after setting this frame, after framing, towards aiming. We are aiming on aggregate demand, on producing things in order to sell them. This is what happens within this framework of optimal use of resources. And it was about aggregate demand, and you can use another term there, you can refer as well to GDP. There is a small difference, but in general terms, it is the same. It is about economic activity translated into effective demand on the domestic level, composed of I, investment, C, consumption, actually it's usually the other way around, consumption, investment, government spending, G, and net export. This is the effective demand, aggregate demand. It's not about the individual demands, but it is about what happens on the societal level, on the level of an economy. And it is important to talk about this as well as a matter of 
a national economy or domestic framework as matter of policy making, of improving, enhancing economic activities. And there we positioned, counter positioned the two approaches, namely supply side orientation linked to uh, Jean Baptiste Say and Keynesian economists as demand side orientation occurring after the Second World War and with the crisis in 29. It was not a fixed date, it was something developing, adapting to the new conditions of society and economy. So it was shaming in this way of it is the supply side, this is not working, it is the demand side, we do not have enough demand. We have or we don't have to intervene, we have to foster these processes, we have to promote or not promote supply or end demand. What do we do? But all this, we said frequently, is as well and not least about gaining. We want to produce things, not because we like to be active, to we like to produce something, but there are two gains. The one gain is derived from the goods we have, from the commodity we buy, and from what we know as utility function. Putting things together, different things individually, meaning as individuals, we have our preferences and we have our own basket of goods and this is what we like to have or what we need according to the conditions under which we live. But then we have another dimension of gain and this is the gain in terms of production. So you see here the relevance again of talking about production, the determination of prices on the level of production, looking at the cost of production, and looking at preferences, personal preferences, marginality. I will consume, I will spend so and so much money on this good because this is worthwhile to do it, for me, not for you. You may have other preferences. So we have huge disputes there. What is more relevant, production cost or marginality subjective value? There are entire schools around this. We won't go into details there. Usually we have a mainstream dominant approach that actually talks about marginalities and marginalities is what is happening on the market and this is not about production but it is about demand and supply that actually determines the price. But what is actually happening when we are talking about the determination of return? Is it just what we get on the market by selling products? Or is it something that actually happens within the process of production? The objective value that occurs as part of production. And this is important to understand. A, that there is a fundamental difference. And B, to think about in details about what is going on as a matter of return. How can we, re how can we uh, determine this? We said what happens in the process of production, not on the market, the market is involved, but what happens in production is the combination of different factors of production, productive factors, their combination that allows us to produce something. What do we need? We need human labor. This is the core of it. 
This is where really values are created, produced. But at the same time, we combine this with raw material. This is the kind of original state, if you want, where we don't have instruments, not least, at least no elaborated instruments, where we don't have machines, where we just have our labor, the ability to change raw material, to gain raw material, and to change it. And then we are getting more and more elaborated in this process, and we say we can use tools, we can use machines, and actually the combination, the way in which we combine this, human labor, labor living labor, machines and raw materials, matters in terms of the return. Meaning, talking about economy and talking about market economy, we are talking about capital. Something we invest as capital, but where we have to differentiate what kind of capital is it. And this was employing the brains of economists and pre economists for a long time. What is it actually that creates value? And then you have different definitions, different understandings of this, where one of the economists said, we have to differentiate between especially two kinds of capital. The one is fixed capital. And the other is circulating capital. So the fixed capital is very much the capital that is invested and that is fixed for a certain period of time, for a longer period of time. Machines, buildings, this would be the typical fixed capital. The circulating capital is something we invest and that goes immediately, is immediately part of the process of production. And that is consumed immediately within this process of production. It is circulated. Now to make things a little bit more complex, but at the same time more easy is we differentiate actually the capital further. And we say that it is not just this difference, but that we have another difference. And this is the difference between variable capital and constant capital. The variable capital, we talked about it, is what is going into the process of production and creates value. The constant capital, similar to the fixed capital, is what is invested into machines, into buildings, and into stuff that is long-term there, used for the process of production. It is in some way going, transferring its value onto the product, but not immediately. So you have to think about three different dimensions. The one is long-term investment long-term 
investment in terms of uh, or into means of production, into machines, into buildings. It is transferring, my, uh, transferring value long term onto the product. And those of you who do accounting know exactly what I'm talking about, meaning after several years you have your building and after several years you can write it off. The building is still there, but there is no value on it anymore, at least not in the books. Then you have the other capital that is going immediately into the product. It is immediately part of the product. And there you have two dimensions. The one is especially raw material, energy, which is from a piece of timber, a raw piece of timber, going into a chair, into a table, or into the product. It is consumed. This is important. There is the consumption of the raw material, and the value is transferred into the product. The value from the raw material is now processed raw material, refined. depreciated. And then you have another dimension to it. And the other is appreciation. It creates value. Variable capital. It is the living labor. It is spent not to be consumed. It is consumed to some extent as well but it is consumed by creating value, creating new value, not just transferring. It is a little bit difficult to understand it because it's an abstraction, but the one is only the change of the material form, timber to chair, timber to table. The other is creating something new. And this is the creation of value. The creation versus the transfer of value. Now the challenge for anybody who is economically active and who analyzes economic processes the challenge is to deal exactly with this combination, the different options of combining material, combining factors of production. You can transport something, a large amount, from A to B. 20 chairs. You have to go 20 times because one share is too heavy or it's too large, you won't be able to carry two through the door. You have to walk 20 times. You have a special little uh, trolley and you can take at least 10 at the same time. It's small enough, you can put them onto the tro tro uh, trolley and you can transport 20. This is the matter, what do you do? Where do you invest? And then you can come with marginality and opportunity cost on, and all this. Only then, you have to look at what do we do in terms of production, where and how do we invest? And of course, we don't do it. The one says, I like actually walking, I take this as an opportunity to have a little bit of exercise. And the other is a lazy guy and says, ah, I just get the trolley and it's much easier. It is about productivity, and the productivity is about gain. We are talking about economics, not about sportive exercises. 
So this is where things come into place of exchanging the productive capacities, comparing them, and then looking for the best option. And the problem is always, the challenge is always to balance it in a way that you are productive, that you increase the productivity, but at the same time you want to increase or at least maintain the return. So this is why we are talking about the determination of return, gain. And of course it matters. What is the price of this trolley? What is the price of the labor time? And then we relate this and we usually come to the conclusion that actually the value, the return is larger when I invest into constant capital, the absolute, in absolute term it's larger because I'm more productive, but at the same time, because the actual value of production, the creative force is here, the rate will diminish. Now, of course, it is very complex in real world economics that you sometimes have labor costs that are so high uh, that it is worthwhile or that it is not worthwhile actually to invest it into it because you pay so much for labor cost uh, so you will employ a machine increasing your overall return decreasing the return in relative terms in other words the money you get back for every unit that you invest is getting less. This is what you have to understand again in terms of the determination of return. It is not about how good are you in selling goods. Of course this matters as well. But here we are talking about how good are you in combining the different factors in terms of maximization of both. And in a way it's nothing else than the production possibility function, the Pareto optimum. You don't want to spend more than you have, than, than you have to do, but at the same time you have to spend a certain amount to increase the return. Now there's one important thing and we didn't talk about it explicitly, but implicitly we always did it, it's competition. I increase productivity for the sake of being better than my competitor, being better in terms of being able to sell more or to sell the same amount of products for less. If my productivity increases, I don't have to charge you 100 units, but I can charge you 95. Because still, I will sell more, even if I earn less per unit, I increase my overall return. Instead of, pay, of selling only one item, for 100, I sell two items for 51 and have a gain, even if I have per item a huge loss in inverted commas. As I said, you always have to consider, you have to put into the equation the cost for labor, the cost of different things, uh, the cost of machines of investment. And of course, it can change over time. And there is this permanent pressure, investment, increasing productivity, means at the same time you undermine basically your own foundation.
you get less and less per invested unit. This is how this system works. What do you do if you cannot invest profitably anymore? You look for another area to invest there, hoping that it is different there, or you invest into something that gives return in another way, namely financial products. This is how bubbles actually uh, emerge. You invest into something where you think, hope that the return is increasing and where you invest, invest, invest and at some stage actually the market and there it comes into play, the market is not able anymore to absorb it, to buy it, to consume it. It can be bo uh, goods for production, machines, it can be goods for consumption. This was the determination of return on capital. It was about gaining and at least there is this misleading term get your money to work for you. Money never works. I told you don't tell your computer in the evening do the homework for me. When you wake up in the morning it's not done. You have to use it. You have to use the computer. It's the same with money. Don't tell your money can you please be twice as much tomorrow morning? There are nice figures on the banknotes or sometimes on coins as well. These figures won't even shake their head and won't nod and won't do anything. The money won't work. It is used by others, it is used by banks to work but it is always somebody working, somebody creating value in different ways. And one of the ways is actually employment. And we know in one way or another that employment is not just about work. There are different dimensions to it and one of the core dimensions is working age. Working age and the other dimension is being available for the labor market, being available to take up employment. It is not about work. I know some of you are working hard, studying. It's not employment. So in this way it doesn't count. Some of you do another work, not studying but just came from the office, they are really working hard on the basketball pitch. This is physical effort, it's work, it's not relevant. Of course, if they are professional players, it is. But if they just do it for fun, it is not. If you do your homework in terms of housework, cleaning up, preparing meals, looking after your children or looking after your grandparents' parents, it is work, but it is not relevant as matter of employment. So the core issue is being able and being willing to participate in the labor market and you have a defined working age. 
I said frequently, I referred you to the ILO, this is the standard, the globally applied standard. You may have different working ages in different countries. It's legal to work with 14. It's legal, or you have to work actually up to, to 70. You have, don't have a retirement age in some countries. In some countries, you have a very early retirement. Here in China, we have a, rally, a very early retirement age. So what the ILO does, it has this one standard figure applied for all. I don't know exactly. I think it's 16 to 65. This is working age. And you can compare it. You can compare it globally and say, this is the figure we take and we compare the people within this age span, how many are working. And not only working, but working in employment, in, uh, in a labor market position. And then you have the different conditions, you have the different definitions there, what it actually means to be employed. Usually it's a certain amount of hours per week, part-time, full-time employment. Usually there is some kind of social insurance involved, and I say some, some kind of social insurance because the patterns can be very different, but you have this overall pattern as a requirement to fulfill being employed. So this is what you should know, where you should go as well through the definitions to say not everybody who is active, not everybody who works is really part of the labor force, is really part of the working population. All this takes place in a specific framework. We talked about GDP, we talked about aggregate demand, and we usually refer to the nation state that is relevant. GDP, gross domestic product. It means we are looking not at economic activities globally, it's not global something product, but it is gross domestic product. Meaning, we have this framework of a nation state, of a national framework, usually, and we have it for a certain period of time, and we say, this is our economy. Having said this, we have to be a little bit careful because sometimes, for instance, in a country like China, I saw comparisons between different provinces. You have the, product, uh, the, the GDP in province A and compared with province B for certain reasons. You can have different frameworks there, but let's take the national framework to make things easy. And we have the employed people in this country. We have the reference to these borders. And we have as well, when we think back about our beautiful figure, investment, consumption investment, government spending, meaning it is here where government is active in terms of economic activities and in terms of trying to control, to develop the economy. Control in terms of promotion, control in terms of getting the most out of it. And then we have export, net export, as a matter of what is it actually that counts for us? How do we deal with what we export and what we import? And there are two 
major overall reference points. The one is circularity. The entire understanding of the economic process is part of the understanding of a circle. Something going wrong. We invest in order to produce, in order to consume, in order to reinvest. We have the market with the two sides of demand and supply. It's a circle. We supply something in order to demand something. So it's going around. And we have the second, which is the equilibrium. It's the idea of the different forces within production and within the market demand and supply should be in equilibrium. You cannot have only demand, you cannot have only supply, you cannot produce and produce, produce, and nobody buys the stuff, and you cannot buy and buy and buy, but nobody produces. And you cannot just export things, just get them out of the country, somebody buys outside, and you don't have anything left inside, inside and vice versa. So the reference, first and foremost, is the reference of a national economy. Within this national economy, within a closed economy, we have these two points of orientation of circularity, the economic circle coming at some stage to an equilibrium, meaning to a balanced relationship of the different forces. Again, important to understand what is actually behind the different aspects, the different moments when we talk about uh, economic processes, when we talk about Pareto Optimum, when we talk about opportunity cost. Opportunity cost means actually talking about cost on the one hand, as the term says, and benefits, as the term does not really say, it's not benefit cost, but opportunity cost. Opportunity, you can take another term for it and say it is benefit. The opportunities are the benefits we perceive. So it is exactly again this question of dealing with an equilibrium. We try to make a cost-benefit analysis. We mentioned this term at a very early stage. We might may we, we try we try okay. we try to make this cost-benefit analysis and say, okay, the cost, the investment, is worthwhile to be done because the benefit is sufficient. It's sufficient in my own opinion, and it is sufficient in terms of production cost. In terms of balancing the different kinds of capital. In terms of getting more in absolute terms and less in relative terms. Lowering the rate, but improving the, uh, increasing the overall amount. This is what we usually do with our small closed economy. Now, in economics, we have two further major assumption, assumptions.
The one is growth. We talked about production possibility franchise, we talked about Pareto Optimum, and we said, looking at it, you cannot improve things. The overall idea, you cannot improve things here by changing the distribution. Any change, if you are on the optimum, any change will disadvantage somebody. Because increasing for one person, improving the situation for one person, means a disimprovement for somebody else. If you have your 10 million, I have one, I take one from you. Even if you don't mention it, you are worse off. So the only thing I can do, so the underlying assumption, I change the overall curve. I move it further and have growth. Here, the distribution is still, and again, Pareto optimal. Everybody has more. Everybody has the same amount more. And nobody is worse off. So you have growth. Instead of producing 10 cars, you get nine and you get one. You produce now 20 cars, you get 18 and you get two. Sorry, there's no car for you left, but it's still Pareto Optimum. So we have the same distribution, we increase the overall activities, and we say, and this is the second assumption basically, we have a dynamic economy. It is not static. It is not that we say, okay, we have enough. We don't have to use more, but we have now enough for the first time and we make a break and come back later.